Guanabenz is an FDA approved uh, antihypertensive drug um, which works by uh, actually binding to receptors in the central nervous system. Um, so it was uh, recently discovered um, through cell-based work, I want to say in 2011, that uh, guanabenz actually is protective um, against endoplasmic reticulum stress. Um, so if you take cells in, in a dish and apply stressors to them, um, that can recapitulate uh, some of the things that happen in neurodegenerative conditions. Um, if you treat those cells with guanabenz, uh, those cells will actually um, survive that stress more robustly uh, than um, if they weren't treated. Uh, so when these um, results came out, uh, we and others were really interested uh, because number one, it's an FDA approved drug um, that patients would perhaps have access to uh, readily. Um, and number two, it actually tweaks um, disease pathways that aren't easily influenced um, by pharmacological agents that, that are known right now. So we thought, okay, uh, we'll go ahead and try to test this in our SOD1 mice. Uh, we didn't dive right into SOD1 mice. We first wanted to see if we could reproduce uh, the results that were observed in cell-based assays. And we actually did. Um, we used a slight variation on the published assays where um, in our system we used cells that were from mice that overexpressed mutant SOD1. Um, and we were able to reproduce those results and uh, this again made us pretty excited. Uh, we thought well now we feel pretty convinced that this drug does what is reported to do. Uh, now let's see if we can test it um, and see if it will make our mice live better and longer lives. Um, what we ended up getting were surprising results. Um, in hindsight, maybe they shouldn't have been so surprising, uh, but uh, the mice didn't really tolerate uh, the drug um, very well. Um, they unsurprisingly got a little bit drowsy, um, to some extent a little bit aggressive depending on the doses that we were using, and it seemed to actually accelerate um, ALS um, disease in the mice. Um, when uh, basically that sort of made us step back from the drug, uh, say this probably isn't a lead that we want to take into the clinic with ALS patients, but um, a few months later, uh, a couple published results came out um, from other groups that uh, tried to present the drug with a different dosing regimen than we had um, in SOD1 mice, and they did observe um, what they described as efficacy. Uh, instead of continuous dosing every day, which we had done, um, the other groups did intermittent dosing every other day. And we thought, well, maybe that's actually um, why we didn't see efficacy. Maybe we need to give them a break every other day. And we tried to repeat um, one of those dosing protocols, and we didn't end up seeing efficacy. Again, we actually saw an acceleration um, of the disease in SOD1 mice. Um, it's hard to explain uh, what might have uh, caused the discrepancies we tried to model our studies as closely as possible uh, to what the, the published report said, uh, but we didn't. So the take home for me is that um, this is an interesting drug in an interesting pathway, um, but if it is going to move into um, clinical use in ALS patients, it needs to be done with care. Um, and it also highlights um, the value of looking at a drug pharmacologically in a whole animal system. Uh, when you reduce uh, the system into a single cell based model and apply a very specific stressor and then apply a drug uh, to mitigate that stress, uh, you can observe benefits. But the reality is that in a complex mammal uh, with a circulatory system, with many receptors, with many different cell types, uh, many different tissue types, 
Uh, the drug can do many things, not just the thing that you're observing in that isolated cell system. Um, it has uh, broader effects and um, giving yourself the opportunity to see those effects, both good and bad, is really important um, and it highlights the value of using uh, preclinical animal models of the disease for drug studies.